Hello friends and welcome to episode one, season one, series one of For the Love Of, my new podcast. And first up, it is For the Love of Acting with Paul Felder. So before we get into Paul, what I've done with this podcast is to have conversations with friends about something that you may or may not immediately associate with them. Now, I've spoken to a bunch of people, which is why this has taken a little while to come out, a little later than I thought, but we are in a pandemic, so let's not uh, be too hard on ourselves. So for the very first episode, I spoke with my friend, Paul Felder. Now, for those of you uh, who have followed my career, you would certainly have been introduced to Paul's. He is a top UFC fighter. He is a top UFC analyst. He does work both inside the octagon and outside, but, one thing that's fascinating about Paul is his background in acting. Now, those that watched his last fight against Dan Hooker might have caught a beautiful piece that they did specifically on this. And I really wanted to do a deep dive with Paul into it. I'd spoken to him about it when we did a gig together in Russia, but not to this extent. And acting is something that I find fascinating. One day would love to uh, have some acting classes. But this was brilliant and I really felt Paul's passion for his acting past shines through it. And actually, I think that once he'd finished the podcast, he started calling up a bunch of agents to see which films he could get into. So I won't uh, spoil any more for you. Check it out. Please subscribe. As I said, we got like another four already coming your way. This is going to be a weekly gig for me. And you're going to really want to hear from the people that I've spoken to. There's some fantastic conversations. And uh, let me know what you think. For episode number one, it is for the love of acting with Paul Felder. I honestly loved that piece that Richie did with you about acting. I thought it was, yeah. it was honestly one of the best sort of main event features that I've, that I've seen, you know? I yeah. Wicked. Um, so on the back of that, you know, I wanted to wanted to talk to you about it. I know that I've, I think we were in Russia and I started talking to you about the whole acting thing a little bit, but yeah, um, yeah, to really put some body around it, if, you, if you're cool with it, just to, you know, ju just go back through and talk to us about it. Because I, I do remember the first time I learned directly from you, we were in Glasgow and mm. you, I think, were doing your screen tests and you said, well, and I was kind of asking you about it, well, I, did act, studied acting, etc. So I go, oh, that's pretty cool. Um, so if we go all the way back, like where did where did this this come from? You know, where did this ability and desire come out? So when I was sixteen, I, I grew up in very much in the inner city, in in a really bad neighborhood. Uh, from the time I was born until I was. Uh, almost on high school and my dad finally got a better job uh, making a little more money and they decided to 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 move outside of the city to the suburbs I mean just outside of the city it's about 20 minutes uh, right outside of Philadelphia so I had to switch high schools midway through my my high school career and I didn't know anybody I had played sports and done martial arts my whole life never done any acting in my entire life but we moved out to this new high school and when I was meeting with the the counselor to figure out, you know, certain elective programs that I'd be able to get into or different classes to fill out my schedule. We talked about an acting class and it was just easy credits. You know what I mean? And I was like, all right, that'll be fun. And I'll, I'll get to meet people. That's an interactive way. And I didn't really want to play soccer anymore. I still wanted to do martial arts. So I had already found a Taekwondo school that I was training at. So check that was figured out. And I started taking this class and uh, I remember the first time I got on stage, we were just doing some improv like comedy drills, you know, just basic stuff um, uh, like the yes, the yes game, like just stupid things like that stuff that you would see on whose line is it anyway type uh, games. Okay. And I fell in love with it. And then from there, I started auditioning for the school plays. So I went from this kid that had played sports his whole life and done karate, taekwondo, kickboxing to you know, wanting to do the, the high school musical, basically. Yeah. I, I wasn't very good at singing. I didn't know how to dance. I didn't really know how to act. But I certainly, just like I do with fighting, just like I've pretty much done with anything, right? I went in 100% on it. Started getting cast in these plays. 
And I was like, shit, I, you know, I love this stuff. And that started taking over my training. I stopped training so much with Taekwondo, stopped competing, wanted to go to school for this stuff. Took a couple of years off after uh, high school and fig- wanted to figure out what I was going to do. So I was working on the side and going to community college. So didn't know what I was doing. I was just getting credits, getting some elective courses, math and, and, and writing courses out of the way. And one of my friends got a, a, accepted to University of the Arts in Philly, which is almost a conservatory, not on the level that Juilliard and those kind of schools are, but trying to be on that level. Okay. And uh, I next year I auditioned, got into that school. And here I am, you know, at University of the Arts going to school for acting at 20 years old at that so- point. So, so pause for a second and I'm just trying to think like, like you've, you've stumbled upon acting almost, but as a yeah. kid, w- was there any part of you? That oh was- man. Yes. Yes. Okay. Before, that, that always had a, a kind of a flair for that kind of stuff. When I was a kid, my mom tells this story to everybody to embarrass me. Do you remember Pee Wee Herman? I do remember Pee Wee. You remember Pee Wee Herman, right? Yeah. When I was really little, I probably about three to five years old, I used to dress up as Pee Wee Herman when we would go out. And my (laughs) older brother still tells this story. He wouldn't, he didn't want to be seen with me. He was so embarrassed, but I would pretend and you had to call me Pee Wee. You couldn't call me Paul. I was (laughs) Pee Wee. And I used to drive my family crazy because I had these white shoes because he had those, those white shoes and I would do like the dance like he did in the one movie that he had. And uh, I wore like a blazer. So it was like a blazer and, and white shoes out on the streets of Philadelphia with my family and driving them crazy. <laughs> and with Superman, I used to dress up as Superman with my cape. You couldn't call me Paul. You had to call me Superman. Ninja Turtles, I used to wear their costumes and running around the house. So I didn't know it at the time, but I was acting. You know, I was pretending. And then once you realize well, as an adult, you can do that on a stage and potentially get paid for it or in the movies. I don't know. It just some came natural. I was always kind of a class clown too. You know, I was that guy. You see how I am in the meeting rooms. I some I try to keep it light. Yeah, yeah. Did you used to do little performances for your folks, for your family as well? Did it? Did you take it to that extent? Yeah, when I was a little older, one of my best friends in the neighborhood, me and him, got a a hold of my dad's video camera. You know, that's when video cameras were coming out and kind of getting big. And we used to take his and make movies. We'd make scary movies. So we used to recreate. Uh, Freddy Krueger movies when we were kids because we had I think we had a mask and we had the glove the fake glove with the <laughs> the ra- the sharp yeah. points on it so we would I was Freddy Krueger and he would just kick my ass I remember th- those tapes are floating around somewhere down at my Brilliant. mom's house bro if they surface <laughs> <laughs> I'm screwed bro I'm so um, screwed if the Freddy Krueger d- documentary tapes come out when I'm you know listen listen if you get, if you get that McGregor fight he's paying <laughs> Big money. Yeah, to he's someone. calling my mom. Yeah, yeah basically, you know, she, yeah. she'll be moving out. She'll be moving into the best neighborhood. Yeah, she, and you know she'll what? Be like, Here's 500,000. Give me one of them tapes. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, we we did a little bit of that. But I've, yeah, I, I like the whole acting thing. It's I'm fascinated by all of these, these different uh, concepts of art, all these different art forms. Uh, and that, that's that's hilarious. So, yeah. 20 years of age, you go, you go to, to art school, college, and is it, what was the course? Did the course cover the, the writing and the structure of, of plays, screenplays, et cetera, or was it very much based on the, the, the performance, the other side? So each semester and each year was, was kind of different. Your freshman year, as you would think, was kind of just an introductory into getting to know who you are, finding out who you are yourself, and learning the basics of things like voice and speech, how to how to speak uh, correctly, how to how to how to kind of get rid of any regionalisms that you might have, you know, hard accent that you might have. Because yeah. I was from Philly, right, and grew up in South Philly. And even though I'd been outside of that for a couple of years, I still had some words that I would hit water instead of water. You know. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. How just hard is that, by the way? How hard that is was that? Tough. To- that was probably one of the tougher things. Right. And, uh, and then, so there wasn't many actual like academic courses. It really was more of a conservatory for acting or for whatever you were going to school there for. Cause it wasn't just an acting school. There was the school of music, the school of theater arts, 
there was the school of dance and then um there was even like uh, graphic designing and industrial design courses as well that people okay. went there for and we all took certain classes together we all had to take like basic basic um like literature classes and things like that but like once a semester maybe one math it was one math course or or one science course in your four years of training okay so you had you had your acting studio every semester and that was what you were primarily graded on and that switched all four years that was a different teacher and a different approach to acting okay. first year was just more fun uh, this woman, Drucy McDaniels, was my teacher, and she's been in several movies, done a ton of theater. She was really good. She just had us do fun stuff and learn how to break down a script a little bit more than you did in high school. You know, how to beat things, how to have objectives. Uh, you know, what do you want in this scene? Like, what 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 is the arc of your your character? And we would go through plays, and we'd find that like the beginning, the end, and kind of beating a script and 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 finding its arc and you know the the story of the whole thing and how to how to get to that and and by this point because now we get you're talking about things that i've wouldn't even have really thought of so i imagine when you embark on a on an acting career that the difference sorry when you go and study at a higher level the difference from doing a couple of performances um when you're in high school to to that you, now you're getting into the technical aspects of how this all yeah. comes together did you did you love that as well? Because that's what it's about. Like in what we do now, what you do as, as an athlete and a broadcaster, but I love research. I love yeah. sitting in this place here, reading and, and studying and then finding, did you like the detail? So just much like I am with fighting and or even commentary and fight research, right? I've never been really good at sitting down and doing my homework, right? That's just not how my, my brain works. But for me, what I really got into was learning to do the technical things like develop a backstory for this person. And I would sit and I would write, I would write in a journal as these people, like if I had a character that was really deep and dark or, you know, had a lot going on or somebody that was really vague was more fun for me than anything. Cause you really had to make everything up. So let's say you were a guy that on the paper, there's nothing there. And I think those are some of the greatest performances. And that's what really got me into that was doing that kind of research. Who is this guy? Where is he coming from? What made him get to this point in his life to do the things that he's doing in this play and why? And start to almost justify it for yourself as if you're playing a criminal or if you're playing somebody who murders somebody, or somebody who's cheating on his girlfriend or somebody that did something terrible. Like why did they do that? And then writing all that out, living it. It wasn't like a method style for me necessarily because I was able to walk away from it, but I got super into that. Because when you're in high school, you're kind of just pretending to be acting, right? You're doing your best impression of actors acting. And that's what you're doing. And then when you get to college, you realize, oh shit, I, I suck. You're just the best person from your high school or wherever you auditioned from that has that potential. You learn pretty quick once you get to one of these schools that you know, we didn't know shit about actually performing truthfully. And I, I skipped a step here because you talked about auditioning to join this, uh, to join this college. Now, yeah. um, there's a lot of pressure there, I would imagine. Did, did you have, was there multiple options for you at this time? You, I guess you, you, were, you were loving this, this avenue you were taking, but if that didn't work out, were there other options? And therefore, like, what was that audition process like? So you had to do two contrasting monologues, right? And one of them uh, w was, was recommended to be Shakespeare or classical in any, in any form. You know, you could do Greek tragedy or anything like that. Good luck with that. So I chose, <laughs> I chose a, a very modern piece. I forget what I did and a Shakespeare piece. And I'm, I want to say, I get, I can't even remember what I did my audition piece for, but I remember my friend who auditioned was like, if you can audition for Charles Conwell, if you can like find a way to audition for him, he was our stage combat professor at school. I didn't know this until I got there, but, and he was the big classical theater guy. He loved Shakespeare. He loved anything with swords and was just a throwback to stuff. So I did a Shakespeare piece for him. Obviously I'm a, I hate to say it. I'm a straight man who 
can play those parts, right? And they're dying for that kind of stuff at a university, like University of the Arts, because there's great singers, there's great dancers, there's all that stuff. But a tough guy, there's not many of those guys that roll through that, <laughs> that, that, that university. Yeah. So I got to audition for Charles. He gave me some notes and I got in. But there's hundreds and hundreds of kids that, that auditioned for that acting program. And they, when I was going there, I think they accepted like 50 to 70 of us a year. Right. So, and I mean. That's pretty competitive. And, and it's funny. Yeah, I had no backup plan either. John. There, was, there, was, there was go to work or not go to school. It was either get in here or I wasn't going to college. Oh, shit. It was really. That yeah, was. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. My you know, SATs, right. like all that stuff. The, the things I had. Yeah, I was terrible at all this. I barely got through high school. Uh, I didn't have great grades. Not because I'm not a smart. I just didn't give a shit. You know what I mean? Right. Like, if it wasn't competing, fighting. Or then, yeah, at this point, acting, uh, I didn't care. That's, that's pretty mad, isn't it? It's pretty mad how the trajectory works and you're like hanging on by a thread. Um, but uh, it's funny, when I think about drama school kids, they are the personalities sort of larger than life. Yes. They sing and dance their way through life. Pretty much how, my, how our toddler is right now. You know, everything is like a performance. It's hilarious. That was, that was the hallways of my, of my university. Was it really? Everywhere. Oh, my God. Are you kidding me? <laughs> and I grew, John, so I grew up in Philly, right? So I went to the suburbs, went to finish high school, and then came back to go to school there. So I was living back in Center City, Philadelphia. All these kids are not from Philly. They're from all over the country. Some of them are from, from, you know, we had kids from the UK. We had kids from California. We had kids from Germany, Mexico. We had kids from all over the place that are suddenly thrust onto Philadelphia. And they're walking around the streets and they're dancing and singing. I remember telling my friends, I'm like, yo, you need to shut the fuck up. You can't, you can't, you know, we'd be in South Philly going to like some house party and they'd be singing down the street. And I'm like, you can't, you can't do that. You're going to get your asses kicked. You were a fucking asset to everyone. Yeah, oh, I did. I helped, I helped them out. And I was a little older because I went to community college. So when we were freshmen, by the end of the year, well, by right now, I, I was turning 21. And yeah. I could buy beer. So I was, you were the guy. I was definitely an asset. Anyway, <laughs> but it, it's funny because uh, like the, what, I, I quit a job in the city and I, I went to work for the BBC. And the BBC was just full of, all these creative types. I, I'm, I'm envisioning this to be a parallel, right? Yeah. And there are a lot of very attractive young women. Like, normal, th their boyfriends and husbands were in the financial markets, which I just left, earning loads of money. They, right. they were doing these creative jobs. And my time at the BBC, like, I had neck ache. Dude, my head was on a spinning <laughs> top the whole time. <laughs> and for, like, a year that I was there, it was just... It was, it, it was mining for gold. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Was it a little bit? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come but on. at the same time, there's, there's a part of me that was like, oh, my God, I, this, is, this is crazy. Because it's also, and I am, as much as people might not see this in me, and I know that you spent some time with me, like, I'm, I'm a bit of a man's man. Like, I'm, yeah. And it just wasn't always that environment. So it was, it no. was interesting. It was a bit of a challenge for me. Yeah. Yeah, I... Uh... It's the same thing. I stood out like a sore thumb because I would get mad. I was, you know what I mean? I was, I, I was still doing martial arts. I was lifting, I'd be doing push ups in like the, the lounge and shit like that. And these people are just, but it became my thing, you know, and people loved me for that. And a, a lot of the other guys that were into that, we eventually got really bonded together over that because we were such a small group. Now we were the minority, right? We're in this university where, art and being open and expressing yourself and doing all that stuff is completely cool now. And now yeah. we're the guys that are watching UFC on the weekends in my dorm room. We're all drinking beer, watching football. We watched when the Eagles were in the Super Bowl. I was a freshman at, at University of the Arts. We all watched that in my dorm. We, we had to write a paper that night. And we were told that if the Eagles won the Super Bowl, we were going to have off the next day and not have to turn any of that in. So we're all sitting in my room drinking like flipping out and then they lose it. And we're like, Oh, oh shit. Oh, so now we're drunk. <laughs> now we're drunk and up at, you know, 12 o'clock at night and have to write these, these stupid papers the next day. It was a good time. Unbelievable. So martial arts then, where, where did this come in? And was there a, was there a moment where you, where you had to sit there and go, do I go left 
or, or do I go right? Right. So that came later, but the actual getting back into the martial arts started. So I started going to U arts and I needed a job, um, just a part-time job to make some extra money. Nothing that was going to in interfere with, with school, but just, you know, 10, 15 hours a week of just keeping myself doing something to earn a little bit of uh, spending cash. So I, I went back to my old karate school and started working as a after school program counselor and a teacher. So all I had to do was really show up there, you know, a few hours a night, teach a kid's class here and there. And that got me back training again. I fell in love with it again because I hadn't been training martial arts when I first started going back to, to school. I was just doing the acting stuff yeah. and being a bit of a degenerate. You know what I mean? I was a kid and I, I, I'm in acting at this point. Um, having fun partying with my friends and uh, you know being cool i'm being the cool actor guy i was smoking cigarettes and doing stupid shit and uh but when i went back to that karate school i was like okay Th i mean this was my first passion was martial arts so i started training again and having fun there and that's when the ufc and the ultimate fighter started really coming out and my uncle phil who was a big supporter of mine when it came to my martial arts he was like a almost a second father figure when it came to that kind of stuff started telling me about the ultimate fighter. Me and my buddy started watching it and they were like, I think you could do this stuff. And I was like, I'll get them. like, no way. I couldn't, I couldn't do that, man. These guys are crazy. I'm, I, you know, I do traditional martial arts. I don't do MMA. And the more I watched it, the more I wanted to do it, started doing Muay Thai instead of just, and I was sneaking behind my karate instructors back. Who's one of my good friends now and a mentor of mine, somebody that Sal Sandon is, you know, this awesome Italian guy from South Philly taught me martial arts my entire childhood. And uh, I was sneaking behind his back to go do Muay Thai. I didn't want to tell him because I thought he was going to get mad at me. Yeah. And uh, that's when I really got the ball started rolling for MMA once I started doing Muay Thai kickboxing. Your ambitions then at college, um, what were they? So until the, just before you started, uh, you know, getting back into to martial arts, you're on this trajectory of acting, I guess, or, or theater. Yeah. Or stage production what, what was it and where did you see yourself in those next what, five 10 15 years so i did really well at, at, at uarts uh, all my professors really liked me they all thought i really had a chance most of them even recommended that i kind of give up theater and go into television and film because that that's where they thought i really had a, a chance because i didn't do musicals i never that was never my thing i did it in high school because it's all we had but once i got to uarts i did you know, I'm saying, I say straight theater. I don't know if you guys call it that. Not in, isn't gay and straight, but straight theater, meaning no music, no dance, just regular theater. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, so I, I, I was doing really well and I was getting cast in all the shows at, at, at UArts. And then even before I graduated, I started getting cast in, in professional productions in Philadelphia. I joined the union. As soon as I graduated, I was working almost all the time, at least two or three shows a year. It was sort of paying the bills and, and making me money. And I decided one summer that I was going to take an amateur fight for shits and giggles because a friend of mine had done it. And I was always training with him and I, I competed with him well. And I was like, if he can do it, I think I could do it. So one summer I trained for an amateur fight. There were modified rules. We had to wear shin guards, bigger, puffier gloves. You couldn't yeah. ground and pound as much. You couldn't do as, you know, it's shorter rounds. And I remember my friends were like, you're crazy, you're crazy. But they all came down to Atlantic City to watch this fight, this actor guy making his MMA debut. And uh, I won the fight and it was just, I couldn't believe the rush. I thought being on stage in front of a sold out crowd on opening yeah. night was a rush. Well, this, you know, it, 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 that no matter what level you are, if there are people watching you fight, that yeah. shit is crazy. Yeah. I don't care if there's 10 people there or 10,000 people. Yeah. The rush is crazy when there are other human beings screaming at you while you are fighting. And I, ever since that first amateur fight, I remember going back to a party. I was like, I, I got to do that again. And then I, it was very slow at first. So I was still working as an actor. And I would do like a play and then I would do a fight. And I would do a play and I would do a fight. And that got me all the way to four and all as an, as a professional, as a professional going okay. back and forth. Yeah. Doing like, they don't go hand in hand, bro. I no. know, they, you know got, the aesthetic gets like, it doesn't go hand in hand. 
Well, John, you've, you've seen some of the older photos before this really started taking. I didn't. I mean, I'm looking a lot more beat up than I was when I was obviously a 22-year-old, 24-year-old kid. Um, my nose wasn't broken. I had no cauliflower ear. I was much thinner. I wasn't as muscular. Um, I was, you know, a pretty boy ginger. <laughs> now I'm a ginger savage. A ginger savage. I love that. It's, it's funny because, it, you know, when you're like, I, I enjoy fighting, but I do remember my first, my first amateur contest. I remember getting out of there and just going, I, I don't know. I don't know if I enjoy it. Like I won, but it just felt more like relief. Yeah. And then it was, then I thought, well, maybe it's because the rule set wasn't as stringent and I've been around all these, I trained with the pros and I, um, and I, I've done some stage stuff, but and now I do the stuff with, obviously, with you guys at the UFC. And, and it is when I'm waiting for that red light, that red flag to go on that camera. It's like, like I want to do the very best for everyone. I feel this sense of responsibility. But it's amazing that you've, but you personally found such a, a massive emotional distinction between opening night, which to me is, again, is just so intimate, especially on stage I, I feel like stage was with with all of those eyeballs everything yeah. you've got to remember because it's not like muscle memory right is it no or, or correct I mean, me well mem memorization it, 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 it's repetitions right you have to just it, it's annoying to, to memorize lines and and more annoying and difficult for theater or for stage production because when you're on film Okay, you get a schedule, right? You know you're filming. Okay, tomorrow, 5 a.m., shuttle's picking you up. It's going to take you to your dressing room, and we're filming this scene with so-and-so. Okay, so you memorize that scene. All you're working on that night, all night you work on that scene. What is my, you know, where, where do I have to be in my headspace? Yada, you show up on that set, you go prepare, you come out, you, you fucking do the scene, and you can do it over and over and over again. Yeah. Whereas when you're rehearsing for a stage production, you're rehearsing every day. We rehearse snippets at a time, but at some point we've got to start rolling it all together. Mm. And once that ball is rolling, especially once the live audience is there, especially once opening night is there, because all the previews, there's always a speech to the crowd. Listen, this is still a preview. You can't review it. If something fucks up or something goes wrong, we're going to, we can, we have the right to stop the play. So all the way up through previews and dress rehearsals, you can, you can work on things, but once it's opening night, that means that the press is there. That means that the reviewers are going to be there. People are there from the papers and the audience is there. You can't stop. Mm. You gotta, you've got to have that, those words and that script. So in your freaking brain that you say them in your sleep and no matter what goes wrong, you can get yourself back on track. And that's, that's difficult, but going to school for it, doing, having to do it, you know, multiple scenes a week to rehearse on in class. So I was so practiced at it. If I went back to it now, man, I really do worry about how I would do with like a full blown production. And I've been in plays where it's two or three act plays with two people, three people. Wow. I've done a one man show. I did a one man show over at the Liverpool Institute uh, for Performing Arts. I did a collaboration with those guys. My school sent a group of us over to Lippa to do collaboration, sit in on their classes. They show us stuff. We work with them. One of the best times of my life, by the way, over in Liverpool. First time going to, to, to England it was Liverpool. And uh, I got to hang out there and uh, live with the students and do acting, sit in on their acting classes. And um, I did this, this one-man show from Sam Shepard called Tongues. And I had a, 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 a musician who was a drummer accompany me to, to the rhythm of the – it was a very, like, uh, poetic – one man show very out there and kind of abstract and we also had a dancer that did interpretive dance to the words and to the music that i was doing so i have this whole script in my head and not i'm not the only one if it was just me up there and i screw it up i have to make stuff up nobody really knew that play right i could make stuff up but the dancer and the drummer are going off of what i'm doing yeah yeah well that, there's a couple of things there that i, that I want to dive into because when may, you just spoke about the, the dancer and a drummer, but typically there's a full cast, right? So you don't want to let yeah. those people down. There's, yeah. it's not just your performance, but it, there's all of these other people and fighting's different. I know you got, t you have a team and you're corner. I know I, I'm not going to be short sighted in that, but essentially it's 
it all rests with you. you. Yeah. And that's, do, do you enjoy, or did you, did you not dislike one or the other? Was, was it, or was there nothing in any of that? Oh, I, I, I always liked working with people. The one man shows that's hard. That, that was hard for me. Uh, Cause there's nothing to play off of. Right. The, the thing that I fell in love with, with acting was, was, was this, you know what I mean? This connection yeah. that we're going to, I'm working off of everything that you're giving me. And that was something that was really in particular drilled in us uh, at my school uh, at U arts, especially our sophomore year, which is when we got into the real nitty gritty, really exploring who you are, really experimenting with kind of pushing the boundaries, pushing the limit of, of theater and what you will do and be able to expose of yourself on stage. You know, um, we had to do a lot of, the, the acting technique was Meis the Meisner technique. Sanford Meisner developed a, a style of acting and it's just about really living truthfully in these imaginary circumstances. And the whole training was kind of, how do you, as an individual, take this script and really make it truthful and real? And it's not about what's necessarily in the script, but what you find in yourself to, to kind of come to that. And the audience will never know that. They'll never know what you're thinking about or what motivated you before you walked on stage, bawling your eyes out. They don't need to know that, that's, that's for you. And that's where we went with that year. And uh, so for me, that was the year that really opened me up. I got an A that year. That was my favorite professor um, that I've ever worked with, uh, Ernest Loso. And that guy was a G, an old Hollywood guy too, man, that um, did a ton of producing. He like for Bewitched back in the day, the paper chase. I think he cast the original Star Trek uh, TV series. Like the guy had been around and, uh, he was a man. He was also a guy too that was very much about comparing actors to athletes, and that you should prepare and live your lifestyle the same way that professional athletes take their craft as serious. Oh, so that was somebody that really stuck with me. Yeah. yeah, it's funny how these people speak to you because of you know the other elements that that you're really in tune with, and how you yeah how you can really respond. Um, at this point then you're getting A's and stuff. It, was there a particular actor? Was there, was there a, a place that you wanted to get to? You're like, right, De Niro, and I want it to be the big screen. Where, where were you at at that point? Yeah, I mean, um, all those old school guys. And Marlon Brando was a guy I watched a lot of when I was younger because I felt like I had that same kind of, you know, the guy that you wouldn't necessarily think to be artistic and an and, and expressive actor and somebody like him, that's, that's, what drove me was these guys that were kind of these tough guys, but had the vulnerability. De Niro can do it too. When he wants to open up, um, Ray Liotta is another one that does some great shit oh, like yeah. that. Uh, uh, Christian Bale is a great actor in my opinion, obviously. Um, what's his face? Uh, Daniel day Lewis is fantastic. He's a little more extreme version of it all though, too. Yeah. Like he really goes, and and is abraham lincoln you know yeah. with his wife in the house and i'm like I, I was never taught that that's necessary i i think you should be able to prepare prepare in the moment for the play do your work ahead of time and be able to go in and out of being that person do you know what i mean did I, you ever see that documentary with jim carrey where he um I, I don't it was an american he was basically playing someone else but it was biographical and he fucking stayed in in that role yeah it was um was it a, another oh comedian God. right yeah he was playing andy andy kaufman is that, is that, is that right? the that name of the guy that yeah familiar yeah that was wild wild and, uh, do you know who else does that tom hardy in the uk yeah, another great and he's he's great too he is he's, he's great intense though like and another guy that i like because he's got a little bit of that alpha dog mentality in him yeah. and i've heard that even from other actors that work with him that when tom's on set yeah. it's you're you're on you're on his set yeah yeah for sure so um, don't put me on the same set as tom hardy he, <laughs> he plays he plays fighters yeah there you go I he's, don't play I think he's a, he might be a blue belt though in jiu-jitsu now uh get the fuck out of here he might be yeah <laughs> he's a hollywood blue belt oh dear um the trip to liverpool then I've actually got a conversation with, with a producer who's done, you know, he's an, an acclaimed producer who went to study in New York. And one of the questions that I have for him is why he went over there. And he's actually a comedy uh, producer. And I'm just trying to think about the differences actually between the UK and America 
and I didn't know if, if that was the same for you, like the way that the, the style of teaching that the, and, of, and also the style of acting, were there yeah. these big differences that you encountered when you went to Liverpool? Big time. Um, but the interesting thing about when I went to Liverpool is they were, try, they were trying to do the Meisner technique as well on the one studio that I went to. And I was in the middle of it, right? So I was very much going through that whole process. So I, I was able to really share this experience with these, these, these kids from over, you know, in Liverpool, most of the kids from the UK. And I was able to have that American flair come over and kind of, cause that's where the technique came from. Same as would be like me going over to a university in, in, in London and studying Shakespeare. You know what I mean? I'm going to get a much more dialed in, uh, approach to that than I would over in America, even though my teacher, yeah. the year that I had Shakespeare was David Howe. He was a guy from England was right. a, you know, came he'd been living in the States for years at that point. But uh, yeah, they, there's definitely what I like about, you know, the British actors and stuff that I've worked with and talked to over the years too, is the way that they, they, they really cherish and, and relish in the, the language of a script and what's right. on the page and especially if it's a good writer, you're telling this particular story. And it is important to hit the words, to hit the right moments and questions and, and, and as it's written. And there's something to be learned from that, especially for American actors who are kind of just like, oh, none of that matters. It's all, it's just all these feelings. It's like, yeah, but if I don't know what the hell you're talking about hmm. on stage, then all your emotions don't mean shit. You yeah. can be crying off in the corner why the fuck is that guy crying in the corner? If we don't know, what's it matter? Another thing, a, a lot of American actors sometimes, especially when I was in college, I, I called it emotional masturbation where it was just like, you were just feeling to feel, right? And I feel like my my uh, British professor is one of those guys that kind of got that out of there. It's like smacking, like, what are you doing? This isn't about you. It's about the story. And if, when people like, for example, if people are really going through something tragic, what are they trying not to do? They're trying not to break down. They're trying not to cry. Right. So you've got to, that's one of those things you learn that is sometimes it's, it's more powerful to just say the words and to, to deliver the message. And that was one of the things that, you know, I learned going over there and talking to those kids and, and seeing Shakespeare and going to those productions when I was over in London and going to all the different theaters and, uh, Dealer's Choice was a play I saw over there. Still one of the best productions I've ever seen of a, of a, of a play. It was such a good play. Uh, I saw Much Ado About Nothing, I think, too, at the, uh, the one main big Shakespeare theater over there. Um, right. I don't know. Anyway, yeah, I'm rambling. Began, but, yeah. Well, Liverpool became, big differences. Uh, yeah, that Liverpool became the center of culture uh, for the UK. Uh, not i mean maybe around that time as well so they were very very artistic a lot of, a lot well, of i had trips i had that trip over there but i also had two trips to to london as well where we that, that's where we went around and saw all all the different productions i think i saw like seven or eight productions when i was over there wow. and stayed over there for a week it was like uh we got credit for it we had to pay for the flights and pay you know x amount for the hotels and all that we all had roommates and if, man debauchery bunch okay. of college kids let american college kids just let loose on london yeah it's nuts <laughs> awesome so now i'm i mean i can see the passion that in which you're talking about this as you're recounting it you get to yeah. i think you said four and oh your your pro rec uh, in professional mixed martial arts and then you i guess it's decision time right you've graduated so is what are the next steps for an actor is it find an agent and just keep on that grind and yep. why did you think that the fighting might why fighting? Did you feel like acting is something you could come back to, but maybe not the athletic side? So it got to the point where I was undefeated and I had four knockouts and I was like, okay. And all my coaches and everybody were like, you need to, you need to really go for this. And you can always go back to, I remember even telling myself, I can be 50 and decide, screw it. I want to, I want to go back to performing. I want to go back to acting. I want to do whatever I want. I can always do any of those things. You're never too old to, to there's always a part for whatever age you're going to be. Right. Right. Of course. But yeah. I was 28. I think when I turned pro, I was late. So I was already getting closer to, you know, 28, 29. And I had to, you know, you couldn't do fighting forever. I couldn't be 50 
and decide to quit acting and want to go be a professional UFC fighter. It's just, yeah. yeah. It's not going to. And the acting had slowed down and it wasn't very good money either because I was doing a lot of theater in Philly. Even though I was in the union, there's just not, there's not tons of money there. You have to be in television or film or on Broadway in New York City to really make any kind of money. And I was getting paid a little bit for, for fighting. And I was like, all right, I'm going to, I remember telling everybody, I was like, I'm going in full time. And I told everybody, st- you know, don't send me any auditions. And uh, yeah. And then uh, I switched a few different camps and, and, and things started getting better. Right. I started finding even better teams, better coaches and better sparring and started training with cowboy uh, and going out there to the ranch. And he really helped me kind of get noticed by the UFC and yeah I remember winning the CFFC belt was probably the first time that I was really confident that I thought that I uh, you know because it it was always one fight at a time and I will see ah, we will see I was just waiting to lose right. and I got to I got to 10 and 0 uh, I think with eight knockouts before I before I lost to Edson Barboza yeah, yeah. in my first loss so, I mean, I made it pretty damn far before I yeah. got stopped. And was, were there people um, or was there a sentiment, like an internal sentiment already always pulling you back, you know, with 5-0, and 6-0? Oh, and oh, Were people calling you up? Are you sure about this? We have this opportunity, you know, agents or whatever it was. Like, what was the reaction and, and how difficult was it to leave that behind? It was tough to see my friends who were still doing it, you know, and friends who were working and parts that maybe I thought I would be good for and that I could have played. And, um, but I was having s- such success and getting more noticed through fighting that I was like, wait a minute, I, I could probably, if this goes well, have an easier time transitioning back into television and film if I can really make a statement as a professional fighter, because I never thought I'd be where I'm at now. Honestly, I thought I'd be, once I got into the UFC, I was like, well, I'll win a, you know, I'll try to win as many UFC fights as I can get a name for myself as much as I can and, and go back. And that'd be a cool story to tell agents and and directors and things like that. Not knowing that they might know who I am or have seen one of my fights already, Mm -hmm. you know, and now we're at the point where, you know, God forbid a couple more wins or a few more big fights in the UFC. And, you know, there's some legit, uh, celebrities that might even see me or directors and things like that. And I keep trying to put it out there. That's why I'm glad we're even talking about it here. It's something I want to get back into very much when it's all wrapped up. That's awesome, man. And how do you think that that training has, has helped you uh, with the broadcast side and, and being an analyst and, and having a camera presence? Yeah. I, even more than the camera, right? It's just the interaction. Like when me, you and Dan are doing our stand up before uh, the fight night, well, we're just, we're talking. There's a script. It's just, it's most of it's made up, right? But we know who's fighting. We know what we have to talk about. We have certain points that we have to hit. So there's, there's an agenda and it's all about us and talking to each other. And if Dan's going to give me some kind of hype or you throw a question my way, I'm working off your energy and we're just, we're having fun together. So I think being able to play off that and improv, right. And, and stay in the moment. Like I learned in theater so much is we have our earpieces go out. We have mics go out. Like we've had some crazy stuff happen to us. Um, We've got some crazy potential dictators sitting behind us in certain countries (laughs) and things. Right. And we've got to just keep it cool and fly with it. I think that's where the acting background really uh, uh, comes into place. Just being able to stay cool in the moment you know and and just just ride through it because when you're on stage man shit goes wrong all the time the audience might not even know it sometimes yeah but uh, you know there's been times where whole pages have been skipped you know like a guy will forget his line and he'll jump to the next thing he can remember and you're like oh shit you're thinking in your head you're like bro that's like the next act how do i how do i take what you just said and get us back four pages earlier to the pressing issue that has to happen so that any of that makes sense later on in the play. And you can see in your partner's eyes sometimes, or it's you sometimes and you just see that, like, I know I just, I just fucked up. I know I just, just get me, get me out of here. Right. And it worked with some older actors too, who forget their lines quite a bit. And you just, you got to be ready to, to MacGyver and ninja some stuff out there. Um, th- there is a selfish angle to me pursuing this conversation with you as well, mate, because I, 
I, I really have been for a number of years thinking about taking acting classes. I very much respect it as, as a, as a trade, as a craft. I don't feel like just because I've done TV work, I can naturally go and do stage or anything like that. But I, I have a fascination with be, honestly being on a movie set. I, yeah. I want to know what it's like. A lot of people say a lot of waiting around, boring, blah, blah, blah. But I've been lucky. All the things that I've really tried to achieve has is, is worked out for me. And I've, I've seen what it's like to be on a TV broadcast, like taped, live. I've never seen a movie. And I, right. I, I really want to do that. And I, I don't, I'd li I like behind the scenes. And I do some producing work, like for the UFC. But I also really enjoy being like under pressure with the yeah. camera on you and all of that. I, and I'm, I'm genuinely thinking, I don't know how, how it'd work out timing wise, when Elodie's a little bit older, but taking some acting classes, but, but has to be the basics, has to be the day one stuff, you know, and I have to enjoy it to earn that right. Yeah, well, it's, and that's, that's, that's what's overlooked so much though, is it, it is all, the same as fighting, right? When you, when you really get down to it, what wins fights, what puts on, the, it's just the, the simple, the simple work and doing the basic things with a script or your character and things like that, that makes sense. And that's what you're going to learn in day one is, you know, you're always, whenever you're on a set, whether it's film stage, you're always, something has just happened and you want something to happen. And there's usually an obstacle in your way, right? This is some of the fundamental things you'll probably learn if you ever get to take that class or if, <laughs> me and you ever just have to start doing one-on-ones on the road when this stuff all clears up we could probably work it out love it uh and yeah man it's just that's really like when you think about your your day-to-day -day life right when you're going to do something you have a task you have a mission you have objectives and shit gets in your way and you're always finding a way around that you know and that's that's all acting is it's just you know objectives and and um like uh what, what were the we used to call them beats too, right? Where things shift. And uh, that's probably one of the first things I learned too, is to find where's, where are things changing? Where is my, how, how do I get what I want? We used to have whole books of like a thesaurus basically of, okay, what do I want from the, how do I get this and actions we called them. What, what's, what's your action here? And uh, that's like the first stuff you learn because it's easy to put right to the, to the script. I, I'm doing this to you. I'm belittling you. I'm encouraging you, um, you know, trying to turn you on. There's a million different things that you can do to somebody. And people don't know that when they're listening to you because that's only in your, your mind. Mm -hmm. To them, it just seems like, oh, that guy's, he's sleazy. Or, oh, that guy's aggressive. Or, oh, he wants something from that person. So it's, it, makes me, it makes me miss it just talking about all this crazy shit. Yeah. I mean, is there a, is there a production in you? And it, when you... Um... Like there's a, there's a lot of legs in your, I mean, you've got a broadcast career as well, but people do have a portfolio career now, like you do yeah. already, but you can maybe add that when something else goes to the side, you can add it in. Have you already got ideas for a production or would, do you want that to be, do you want to be like a, a, an actor for hire or do you want to be the guy that creates the whole thing and, and, um, and casts yourself as the lead role? So I've never been, I was never really great at, same as I'm not great at coaching necessarily. I've never been really great at directing a full production or putting things together like that. I have always been good at, you know, this is your role. This is the play. I work well with directors. I take direction well. You know, I like to collaborate with that kind of stuff. Um, so I really want to, I just want to jump in and be an actor again. I want to be hired. I want to audition. And I don't want to do, you know, the next um, Street Fighter 17 you know, right. or Bloodsport 3, Revenge of the Irish Dragon bullshit. You know, I, mean, I don't, <laughs> Broke back I, I, I want to, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Broke back Mountain 3. Uh, <laughs> only if you're cast with me, John. Only if you're cast whoa, with me. Whoa. Me, me, you, and Hardy. Oh. Broke back Mountain 3. Oh, okay. UFC. The, the internet always wins, Paul. You can't be putting that out there. Someone's oh, great out. poster as already. Soon, as soon as you throw this, that poster is going to be, it's going to be <laughs> us with our mics and they're going to just use our heads and it's going to be naked bodies. Oh, good Lord. Cowboy hats on. Oh, no. Oh, so, yeah. So, I, yeah, I just, I want to just have fun with it again and not, not necessarily just because I'm a martial artist and a, 
and a fighter. Um, I don't necessarily just want to do martial art movies, but I'm, I'm willing to do things that if it's a movie where it's about MMA and that person's a real person mm -hmm. and a real character, I mean, of course I would love to do that. So, you know, there's, there's some things out there that, uh, I'm looking into and, uh, yeah, I want to give, I want to get back and I want to do film. Same as you. I, that, that's my next, uh, adventure for sure is I haven't done much, uh, television and film myself, just little extra parts and maybe a little line here or there, but nothing, nothing juicy enough. Interesting, mate. I'm sure that the opportunities will present. I'm sure of it. Um, you know, you're doing a cracking job, like accolades all over the place. Everyone recognizes your work behind the mic. So, um, but listen, you, we, we want you there still. And we want you, um, given all that you got in the octagon as well. So, uh, let's not yeah. get sidetracked just yet. Exactly. Um, exactly. Hold on. Sorry, John. There we go. Sorry about that. Yeah. My no friend, worries. one of my buddies is calling me. Well, mate, I'm going to let you go. I'm going to let you take that call. Thank you so much for this. I've really enjoyed this. Um, I feel inspired for you, you know, with, uh, with all of that. Um, walking back through acting, it's never a conversation that I thought we'd have, and I'm learning all the time. And this is yeah, kind man. of the, the point of this podcast. So um, thank you again. Stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, keep, that, keep that family of yours safe as well. And mate, I truly hope we get to work together again soon because it's oh, been really too long. You have no idea, man. I was already really looking forward to the London show oh. and, and the Dublin show and all these shows. Like truly, really, really was. Like I couldn't wait to get on the, on the road with you guys and do the European shows and get back at it. And uh, I can't wait either. And I'm sure we will, man, whether it's in a few months or another year, we'll, we'll be back on those mics together. Um, and we can do this whenever you want, man. Anytime you want to do these podcasts or chat or just uh, hit me up. Great talking to you and same to you and hope the family as well. And I hope, I hope that you guys both got it already. I hope that truly was you having it and that shit's, you got, you've been through it and you've passed it. Yeah, me too. Me too. Um, all right, mate. Thank you very much. Um, we will speak again soon. Yes, sir. All right, John. Take care, brother. All the best, mate. Cheers, mate. Thanks, Thank man. You. Cheers.